Hey, welcome back to another video at the Kunal Naik Learning Data Science in Nonlinear Way. And today we have with us Kagan. He's a software developer, a machine learning engineer, and an aspiring entrepreneur. He was uh, kind enough to accept my offer and then give us a demo of a certain product that he's going to build, a small API that he's going to build, and uh, help us learn this particular concept properly. And thank you, Gagan, for doing this. And tell us what we're going to do today. Um, yeah, thanks so much for introducing me. So today, we're actually just going to be building a very simple sentiment analysis API. Hey, Data Geeks. My name is Kunal. I help you master data science through non-linear methods of learning. So before we dive in, make sure you subscribe to my channel so that you never miss out on any of the awesome tricks to learn data science. We'll be using basically three important tools here. So one of them is Google Collab, which is a node, which is basically like Google Docs for, for Jupyter Notebook. It's a really fun collaborative environment to run your Python notebooks. And here I'll be using uh, the Transformers library, which is built by Hang and Pace. And I'm sure like uh, most of you might be heard. And I think I will put in the description as well, all these links too. Uh, so it's really easy to use. So what I'll be actually just doing here is first I'll actually explain how the pipeline works and what kind of different models do we have there. And then I'm just, then we're just going to be showing a simple example with a simple query. And then we'll be deploying that same model uh, to a part to an API. And the API will be currently running on a local host system. And we'll and then we'll explain how to how to like upload that API to a Docker file as well, awesome. so that uh, awesome. so that becomes easy to share to uh, to anyone as well. Awesome, thanks, thanks, uh, Kagan. So let's get started. Awesome, yeah, let's get started. Um, so I think so for anyone who's not aware, so Transformers is the lead is the most popular ML NLP API at the moment. And it's really easy to use as well. So I'm just gonna run. So it, I'm just gonna run this cell. So so, what I, so it's actually, I'm just going to install the Transformers API. And so one thing that I'm going to use is the Transformers pipeline. And in particular, so we'll be using the sentiment analysis pipeline here. And as we can see, so in the sentiment analysis pipeline, so I'm using a particular model, which is distal based and gas fine tune S, SST to English. And so this and what, what is really nice about this model is that we, the accuracy of the model is more than 95%. Which, and this model is the highest, uh, like the highest accuracy model for any sentiment analysis for Eng particularly for English. So this is actually this, uh, and the mo and the best part of what I really like about the model because usually models come like really heavy if they have if they have an accuracy of more than ninety five percent. As you guys will see, this model is just two fifty, just less than two fifty MB. Again, because it is uh, because it is just a bird. Um, so like as we can see, so it's downloading the model here, and the model is just two sixty eight MB. So this actually, so the advantage of using a smaller model is that whenever we do run it as an API, uh, it won't actually just start hogging our system memory as well. Because it happens quite often that whenever we're using a heavier API or a heavier model, it starts actually just using up a lot of memory in our system. And our, and like it has happened quite often that our, on like on base instead on base on our system just crashes and we like we left it nowhere and we're just stuck there. So that's why I'm just going to be using a small model here, which is, which has a good accuracy as well. And, uh, and are, so there other, are there other models that uh, are like very heavy and state of the art, mm -hmm. which you um, personally uh, have used or, I mean, this is a very good baseline to start with. I think this is a really good baseline to start off with, but uh, there are, there are different models as well that can be used here. So I think one of the biggest models is just bird. Mm -hmm. So bird, we are bird based on case. Um, so guys just go to if you guys go to honey face and maybe just look at the models here so this is a really common model and it can be fine-tuned to work to perform sentiment analysis as well or any text classification problem and there are multiple models available here but uh, again as i said we'll just be using this for just the focus model here i mean as, as i've mentioned already it's uh, small and fast as well so it gets it gets accuracy in, without using a lot of memory and I think the best part of using these models for using the pipeline here is the ease to use. So here, let's say here I have like a text that I want to analyze. So it just says that I'm extremely happy to share this video with all of you, which I really am. Mm -hmm. um, so it just, so it's just really easy to do it. So here again, so for what I've actually done here, so I have my, and so I've defined NLP, which is just a keyword here. 
and I've defined it as the pipeline, uh, which is the sentiment analysis pipeline, which is basically a text classification pipeline that I'm using here. And so once I actually do call the pipeline, so with my, with my query, uh, what, what it's going to do is it's going to give me the label, whether that's positive or negative. So we also do get a neutral sometimes and in this case in which it cannot define whether it's positive or negative. And we also get the confidence score with which it is sure, which it is sure that whether it's positive or negative. Um, so that's so it's, it's quite simple. So it's basically in basically in less than three lines we have where we basically have a whole sentiment analysis pipeline set up here. And I think that's this is and that's the beauty of it. And and today we just actually just focusing on sentiment analysis, but there are multiple things that can be done. There's text generation and there are and they're like question answering. There are a lot of things can be done here. Uh, but for today we'll just be focusing on how to use how to build like a sentiment analysis model here. Absolutely. And so basically the framework remains the same. Um, uh, the process remains the same. It's just that you change the pipeline to give a different outcome and that pipeline will do that particular thing. You change the model and the outcome differs, right? But the process, the framework remains the same. Um, so maybe again, as again, so maybe if you want to use like a different pipeline, a text generation pipeline, or maybe a question answering pipeline. So all we need to do is just change the keyword that we provided here. Mm -hmm. to say text mm -hmm. generation and we would and we would get a different model and different pipeline there as well. Awesome. awesome. And so that comes really easy. Yes. So I'm excited to look at the background of this though. <laughs> so this is the this was basically just so till now so we were just talking about how like the model works. So this is actually just the ready. So this, this is basically just using like a black box and just connecting it to use to use it as a form. Uh, but there are other ways to do it as well. So you can like maybe just fine tune your own model using PyTorch or TensorFlow, or maybe maybe just build your own models using TensorFlow and PyTorch as well. Just build using LSTM. There, are, it's quite easy to make a sentiment analysis model out of the box, like out of the box as well. But here we're just going to be mm -hmm. using a simple pipeline here just to build our just to build our API, keeping like. Mm -hmm. And again, so again, it's possible to fine tune these models as well, because uh, I mean, there are some data sets which are quite biased um, as well, as well, just to make, just to figure out, just to remove those biases from the data set. It's quite important that we fine tune our models as well. And to, depending on the use case, it is use case um, on some cases where like where the data set is predominantly negative, or maybe if you're dealing with like something that, so maybe some, maybe a horror movie or something like that, where the data set is predominantly negative, it is, Quite important to make sure that you fine tune your data model and get the right get the right results. Um, otherwise, uh, it might otherwise we might have some outliers here and there, and we might and the model might not be able to classify them correctly. And so, I think just getting into the nitty gritty of it and how to actually just build the API, build the API. Okay. Um. Okay. So I think and the second tool and the, the third tool that I'll be using here is Fast API. And so fast API is actually, so there are actually multiple ways how to build like an API from, uh, to build a web framework from uh, in Python. So there's Flask, there's Django. And one of my favorite ones is called fast API. And I think the best part about fast API is that it's fast. <laughs> and so if you guys actually just go to like the web fast API like website as well, um, you guys actually would see that it, it has, it has performance, which is comparable to any of the web frameworks that are built in Go as well. And, uh, and so I think that is pretty big because, um, I'm sure like all of us do know, like flask also does become a bit slow over time. So that's, so I think just using fast API and I think you, the ease of use of fast API is really huge as well. And so just getting started with it. And here I'm just, since I've just used one pipeline, one API, like one library here. So I'm importing, so I'm just importing you. So to run the fast API, we actually have to use something which is called UVicon. Which basically, which basically runs our, so which basically transforms our API into, so that we can use it on our local host. Okay. And mm -hmm. once we do, and once we do and that, we'll, will, is it a different thing when we are using a server based or deploying it in some server, not on local? Uh, it's the same thing. It's just, it's almost, it's the same thing. It's just basically, okay. it's basically what it runs the API. Got it. Um, yeah, I'm gonna get to that. What what, what the differences are when once versus when we're running it on server versus when running running it on local host. Uh, I'm gonna get to that in a second. Sure, sure. Um. So yeah. So I think the first step uh, before starting out is to define our define our app, or uh, which is so which is app is equal to fast API. And so here we're using the most simplest and the most uh, like the simplest version of the API, and not actually just creating anything else. And here I've actually defined my output here as well. So I, I actually do get two things. So as I've shown here, so I get a label which says positive 
and I also do get a score which says which uh, which gives us the confidence score. Correct. So here I've Correct. also so I have defined the sentiment uh, which is which is going to be the label and the and the sentiment probability which is the confidence score which is given to us by the model. And so that's so this is just going to be my output. Um. So one thing that I've actually done here. So and I've actually just copied this line from here as well. So the same this is the same pipeline is being imported here too. Uh, we're going to be using the same model here too. And one thing that I do like to do is uh, create like a generate data function or an input function to the API, just in case. So when we do actually do, are dealing with like heavy models or maybe custom made models as well. So one thing that does often does have often have like happen often is uh, that like, our API would actually try to call the model again and again, and it will load the model again and again in the system. Which can lead to like which can lead to a lot of memory being accumulated by the model. But what I like to do, what I like to do is create a function like this. It basically just does just adds you know, like it just adds says like return day like NLP. It just as a one line function there. Uh, mm-hmm. But what we can actually do we do is we can cache this function here. Okay. So we can cache this function in memory. Uh, but um, like and if you would want that, we can do that here too. Uh, I'm not currently doing that because we'd just be running it and uploading it to a Docker file. And okay. to apply, if you're uploading to Docker file, there's no need to cache it. But if you're actually running it in a local system, mm-hmm. uh, it's better if we actually do cache it as well. And Fastavia also does have a way of doing that. Got and it. I think right. it comes really easy. It, it's more important when we're also deploying it with the front end as well. So maybe if we create like a streamlit front end. Mm-hmm. Or a basic like an HTML front end as well. Uh, just ha- just like caching the model and just keeping it there. Mm-hmm. Uh, makes it really easy to use too. Got it. It's like in- instead of uh, you know having to get that model every time. It's that mm-hmm. you keep it once and then you continue using it while it's there in on the system. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. That that that's that perfect line. Right. Um. So yeah. So now actually just getting getting in the root of it. Um, so we actually do define. So uh, right now here I have two endpoints that I've defined and they're, and they're pretty simple. So I have two get endpoints here. Um, so one is just the base, just the root endpoint, which just says, uh, welcome to the sentiment analysis API. Um, so now actually just to run the, run the file and should like to see like whether it's working or not. So all we need to do is just go Python um, API. Uh, and api.py is my file and okay. once i do yes so it's actually just it's actually gonna start my api it's gonna start my api at the local host uh, with local host port 8000 um yeah it just takes a bit and then we should be ready um so as we can see it's we are ready here okay um, so let me just go to 8,000 and here we have the message welcome to the NLPI. Okay, so basically the, at this point, the API is packaged and it's launched. Like it's it's yeah. live basically. Exactly. Okay. And so what we do, like what we do see here is like we get the message, which is which is says welcome to the MLPI. But that we, that we have again defined here as well. Um, so what? So again, so just getting in. So this is how it's, this is how easy to it is to run, mm-hmm. and there's no and there's not nothing else involved here as well. So just going to the local host here. So we we are going to just go there, and and, then, and so one thing the best thing about uh, like the fast API is that it uses Swagger as well. Um, just to be so instead of like in Flask, when we actually building Swagger, we actually got to follow a lot of lines of code and set up multiple files to set, set up Swagger, but Fast API already does the job for us, so we just can just go to docs and we do get the Swagger UI to there too. So we can go and explore what kind of different uh, endpoints we have here. Okay. And as I said, we just have two endpoints here, so it's so it's gonna be really simple. Got it. Mm-hmm. And what is that API v1 slash ht? Is that a location? Uh you see get API slash v1 slash ht. So is that a flow folder structure we have to set up? Um so again, so this is a personal thing. So this is just something that I like to do. Mm-hmm. Um so mm-hmm. since I since I'm actually just building an API mm-hmm. and it's like it's version one of it. Mm-hmm. And so what I'll be doing is just sentiment analysis. So I just usually like to have a keyword, the version and the API name. Okay. 
um that again that's a personal preference if some if like i know some people just like to have uh, just in the the version name as well or just the keyword okay um i i, I usually like to specify like the version name as well so that once we actually are do, done with like we can have multiple versions of the same api there mm-hmm. and so, just like yeah. yeah and and so like basically uh, you know whoever is using this api and uh, whatever Uh, integrates with their application. They can go back and forth and use whichever version they prefer, and so it makes it easy to uh, for the end user to really use it uh, and to identify or search for the things that they're looking for. Exactly. Yes. Um. Because yeah, right. Right now we here we just have one API, right? But and like in the real world, we might have multiple APIs at the same time in the same file. And it can get really tricky if you have if you have the same if you have the API with same similar names. Mm-hmm. So it's easier to classify it by versions and just have like different, different like instead of having different keywords, it's better to classify by versions, right? Got it. Um, because it becomes easier to search. Got it. Um, so again, so just coming to the main, so the main function, which is uh the sent, which is which basically returns the sentiment analysis here. So as I said, I've actually created. I'm just gonna call the NLP pipeline. So I've set up a function which can cal, which can be used for caching here. and all we going to do here is we just going to call that function and we will return the value that is called uh, that is a, uh, we'll just return the value that is called mm-hmm. so we won't be doing anything else we just call the function and then return the value got it um is, and it's just really simple so it just really so just sentiment is equal to generate data and and we get the value and so one thing that i've done here is to so we actually do need to get the data which is a string uh which is basically mm-hmm. what we want to analyze here and so one of the best things about like me using fast api is that we can uh, we just we can pass it on like the like that mm-hmm. uh so so like a normal function how we would pass um so here i have defined like data is which is a string mm-hmm. so what like so how it will actually run it is um so let's see so i'm just going to go back to the docs here and You need to put so let's a, a, any any string there within that place. Right? Um. So, like, do you have any thoughts? Do you have any ideas what string should be put there? Uh, I I hate uh, running. <laughs> um. Let's go there. We give a easy word to classify. <laughs> um. That that is true. It's too easy for it. Um. But so as you can see, like, so the request URL that was given here. so it creates this part on its own so it adds uh, it has a question mark and then it creates it keyword field i hate running on its own so we don't really have to define so in like in file fast and other things we really have to define what goes after like the question mark and stuff right, right and right. here it becomes really simple because it's just a line, it's just basically like a simple python function here mm-hmm. um uh, but just calling that uh, would set it up here as well and um, if, and if you're using any other api services this string has to be completely written like data is equal to and you will have to uh, write codes to basically build that part after question mark mm-hmm. and what other uh-huh. variations do we have like apart from string we have what are the most common uh, variations of input we can get there Um, I think so. I mean, I mean, like, so we have already do have all the data, like the data data types that can be passed. We can pass like a float, a list, or any any other thing that as well. Mm-hmm. And one of the best things that we can do is we can also create like a particular class like this. Like, so for our, I've actually created for output, but we can also do this for input. And we can define. So if I actually define my data to be part of like a sentiment model. Um. So it will then expect like it will then expect form in a in a JSON form. Um. Like I, I will actually just expect a string and then a float as well. Um. So basically, this would actually create a JSON, a JSON form, and this is based on from the base model from Pydantic, and which is so this be so which will basically convert it into a JSON file, mm. and then send it to our API. Got it. Okay. 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 Mm-hmm. Awesome. So now, uh, uh, like we got uh, the sentiment analysis is the final method that actually gets you the. Response that the label and score, right? Here, and here, as we can see, so like, so we actually run the query, which is I hate running. And here, and we and we've got like the label is negative, and the score is ne- and the score 
is quite neg- is quite positive as we see quite high so it's pretty sure that it's negative got it got it <laughs> can it do like a sarcasm uh, let's try to detect a uh, uh, sarcasm if possible like uh, 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 i like you not probably something like that uh so it's not yeah I, yeah i th- uh, yeah uh do you remember any any sarcastic comment <laughs> yeah it's difficult to remember on you as such yeah yeah it uh, usually you typically have the bite but uh, right now i'm just running out of ideas um, okay. but anyway Uh, but yeah, I think so. This is basically just be for like a binary classification here, so just positive or negative kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And for a, like for the model, it's quite difficult to identify whether it's like what, what, what like is it a sarcastic comment or as such. And I think that's that's one of the been the limitations of just like any text classification model. It's really yes. difficult yes. to identify sarcasm. Yes, yes. So, but but I think we'll soon get there. Um, yeah, yeah. So I've actually never seen a model that is really accurate at identifying sarcasm because oh, it's just. Have you have you tinkered with a lot of uh, examples in this area? I I've actually played around with with a lot of like the circle like uh, text like sentiment analysis and text generation models and like just trying to classify these with like the PyTorch as well and just building like custom models not using these out of box as well. But I've never seen. something that gives you like more than 90% of accuracy in like in the test sets okay um again so i actually like to think that when it's i find a lot of humans trying to difficult to understand sarcasm so it will be difficult for a model to do so correct correct yeah even i find it difficult sometimes <laughs> so 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 now we are at this stage um the docs uh, we are able to test it out and uh, so and so the next step would be gagan here um so the next so i think the next step here would be actually so once we have actually completed so we are we have our python code here so we are able to run it as well mm-hmm. and again it's really easy to run it's just python so the next thing that we do is we create a requirements file mm-hmm. um as we do it for any python project uh, we cuz i mean it's really important to create a python requirements file so we just specifying the model like the models and so one thing that i like so sometimes if the model if the newer models come and like the newer updates come but and we're not really dependent on any of the updates i usually just like to not mention the like the version there mm-hmm. um because like newer features might do and has sometimes do enhance with uh, given and some of the features there so it's it's better just to install the latest version mm-hmm. and so once so once you actually have created the file um so once so our structure would actually look like this uh, okay so we have so in the in the root in the root directory we have a folder which is called api inside that we have the file api which is this file and then we have the and we have the requirements for txt file okay within the api uh, uh, folder or within the examples folder within the example so this is basically um, so we have mm. three things here we have the api folder the doc file and the requirements are txt correct and okay i think the most important thing about like any so it's any ml of thing is just actually just sharing model and just sharing the api which can be done um using a docker file or just a docker image here mm-hmm. um so what so what again what we do here so this actually is so this docker file has been optimized um so this actually can use a custom model as well so if we are using a custom model mm-hmm. uh, we can create a model folder and so if we do not have any custom models we can just leave it like that so this is like this is like my boilerplate for any docker file If I do have a model, I just leave it there. If I do not have it, um, it's it's still there. It does not really matter. Yeah, and and basically, a model would mean a pickle file from, let's say, a classification model or something like that, right? Like so, the one anything that you... like then, like an dot h five file or a pickle file, mm-hmm. or we see or any model that we have saved. Um, so one thing that we can do is maybe we can just we can save this model as well, and if you want to like if you just have it on a local file, and we can save the model as well. Uh, but i mean if again that's a personal preference if you want to save it if you don't want to save it uh, but yeah that you just save it like in a model directory got it and yeah. yeah so i think i've seen like quite a few people would want like the model also to be in a docker file and just stored in one single repository so that there's nothing else missing from the missing from it and uh, like a complete package can be sent out to the customers got it got it um, again, so it's a preference i mean uh, 
Uh, uh, I mean, yeah. So one thing, other like other the model can be packaged separately and sent as well. And so the and so the customers would have to like on base would have to package them together. All the model can be packaged as one as one single package and sent to the customers so that one all they have to do is one click and mm-hmm. it's ready and they can and they can use it like how we are using it here. Got it. Okay. Okay. And so what and so what we do here is that so I think uh, so what like the creator of Fastapi and his name is Sivan. His name is Sivan. So he has actually created a really nice Fastapi Docker file. Which is all the which has been optimized for which has been optimized for fast API and all its uh, dependencies as well. So we'll just be using that and using Py and using Python three point seven. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so we so we have three things here. So we have like the uh, we have the API file and the requirements file and the Docker file here. So first thing we'll do is copy the requirements or txt file into the root directory. And then we'll also copy that, the that dot is important actually. I, I miss that dot a lot when it does. Can you tell like again the importance of that dot? Um. So in the importance of the dot, so that was just just copy it into the into the root directory, right? And so dot represents the root uh, directory. Directly of the doc of the Docker files VM. Okay. Um. Because like the Docker file would actually run on a VM on the on the like on the base, right? Right. 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 Like. So as we have it, um, so Docker. So we just need to. Uh, so what we do is this will actually just draw, copy it into the Docker files VM, mm-hmm. and as well as we'll copy the as well as that we'll copy the API file also into the VM, and then and the, then the model will be going to the model folder, not directly to the root folder, but yeah, okay. Um. So depend and again th- again that's like depending on how we want like how we would want to do it. Mm-hmm. Um. So we and so because just to have the same hierarchy that we have here, so we want so we, like if you have model and model folder, we have we maintain the same hierarchy in the VM folder in the VM as well. Got it. Okay. okay. And the Docker file as well. So that so that like it runs the same way how we are running it on a local system. It runs the same way there as well. Mm, right. And then and then we do like the most common for most common platform. We just do a pip install or uh, uh, like requirements.txt. And one thing that I did like to mention here is like so we are actually running it on the, on the post eight eight thousand here, and so we have actually so I've actually currently specified this as one twenty seven point zero point zero point one, which is the local host address here. Ah, uh, but to run it on a on a Docker file, we would actually have to change this to the Docker file's local host, which would be zero point zero point zero. Ah, which which need need to be changed. So if we are actually running it. On look on our Docker image, we our look our host would be zero point zero point zero one point zero. Got it. And once we do have that, and so and so we will expose a uh, code eight thousand here, and to, and so and since I mentioned like the command is Python run a Python API API API, and once we do run this, so automatically so this is so it's just really simple. So just like seven lines, it's just seven lines of code here. And we have a running Docker file there. Got it. And and now it just uh, you know we deploy this Docker and uh, it's not on our local host; it's somewhere else. And uh, mm-hmm. we can uh, the u- end user can access it without uh, interruption. And yeah, that and that is so I think the only and then once we do that, so we just need to do Docker build, and so this mm-hmm. will build the Docker image. And once we and then once we do that, we can just do Docker push, and so it'll just push it to Docker Hub, and so and anyone can just extract it from Docker Hub using Docker pull, and they would have it, and they would have the API along with the model on their system as well. Awesome, awesome. So yeah, that's and, uh, that's it. I, I guess uh, so. Once uh, this good. is deployed, uh, we are we set to go. And uh, I had a few questions there, uh, Gagan. Like, um, you know, so if you had to add other APIs. Um, like this is one API that you build. Like if you had to build another API, so you you keep naming and you put it under the API folder. You keep writing all your APIs under the API folder, right? Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um. So yeah. so suppose like maybe if you have like uh, so we find just like a tab. Uh. So let's say if you want like a post API here. Uh. We we just go with API. Um. Slash like uh version one version two. So because we've done one version one. And let's go with the same keyword. 
and so the and so this one maybe if I just put like on the same thing here, and this one and running the file again. Uh, we see this. So we have actually have we have like a different post API with the same with the same like on the same nomenclature here as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but we would have a different, we would have a different endpoint here, and so this it's quite easy just to create like a different endpoints as well, and we can create a different. So actually, just create like the same the same API, but this is a post one. Mm. Oh, we have to change the host for yeah. uh, running it in local. Um. Yeah, but I mean, there is a way to actually just run like zero point zero zero on local system as well. But I just I think whenever we run it on Linux, it actually defaults to zero point zero point zero. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't really use that on Linux as well. I just prefer just using Windows. So yeah, yeah we really got yeah, it. Yeah, uh, you're, uh, you're one of the first rare person I've seen uh, who's using Windows for uh, programming. <laughs> um, yeah, I actually did. I actually do have like Linux as well, but um, I got to use Linux. I got to use the Windows for some reason. Yeah, I think for going live and all that thing, it's a lot easier with, uh, uh, with yeah. this. So here we see we have like the same we have a post API here. Okay, okay. Awesome. So that's simple to just layer it. And then you group uh, okay, okay, awesome. So different you just create another endpoint and then write your function and then get get uh, done with it. Awesome, awesome. Thanks, uh, thanks, Gagan. We and, do have uh, like we have all the like HTTP headers here. So we have like uh, we have head post and input and all these things there as well. So anything that anything that we would want, we can add there as well. Awesome, awesome. And I have one more question now. If you've done that for one string, but let's mm -hmm. say you want to do it on a data set or something like that. So uh, I mean, you don't. Uh, how, how do you uh, basically write that same uh, code so that it applies for a couple of rows within uh, mm -hmm. the uh, the end user point? Um. So I think one thing that we can do is so we can actually just like do it one by one as well. So uh, mm -hmm. one the most the, well, the one thing I would like to do is I would like to modify this generate function here, mm -hmm. and so that we do so that we do it again and again. So we do like batch processing here, and so just doing one by one. So we but do like one. in the batch yeah. processing, mm -hmm. and I think so it returns. So it's gonna classify all of them at once, and then just return the result. Right. Right. So it's again, so instead of classifying, so instead of classifying all of them together, like one by one, it, so that it can cache the result as well. So if there are any of them common, it would just return the values faster as well. Got it. It's like we'd say 5,000 at a batch, process it one, mm -hmm. keep, keep it, and then keep doing something like that. Again, but that's yes. another ball game uh, to deal with yeah. number and all of that. But yeah, I just wanted to, you know, give a direction of how to think in terms of like, <laughs> We did one endpoint. It, it's very useful for let's say uh, putting it on a website or a page and displaying the results. But let's say you want to do a bulk stuff, then it has to be written in different way, and a lot of other nuances need to be taken care before it can be completely final. So yeah, uh, thanks, Kagan. Do you have anything else that we need to keep in mind to ensure that this doesn't fail? or any other uh, in your experience that you know that you'll commonly come across this kind of errors? Um, I think one of the most common errors that like usually people come across is that it's, I mean, one thing, as I mentioned, like the, uh, like the host is not correct. Or if like there are a few things that can like, uh, if there are any errors in the model as well, or if like the model is still not functioning or if you're not getting the right results. Because um, usually at, when, once we do come at the stage, once we do, because usually we are building an API at the production stage mm -hmm. where the model has been tested or everything has been done and there is no more then no more changes to the model. So it's, I think it's really important that the model, like the ML model is pretty serious and secure and it's working properly. Because mm -hmm. um, again, it's difficult to make changes and make bug fixes in the production. Correct. So like just building an API is usually the last step of any project or the last step of any of the things that we do. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think it's just quite important to make sure that all the other steps are working, all the other things in the pipeline are working first and working perfectly before we get to the, before we get to the part, because as, as I like shown here, it's quite easy. It's almost like a boilerplate and a template that we can use here. Mm -hmm. And it's just like one click deploy kind of thing. So once, so it's quite easy to do this part, but I think it's important if we do like the work before this drop quite well. So this goes really smoothly too. 
awesome awesome and um so if you're watching this guys uh, why don't you just go to hugging face right gagan has done one particular model all you need to do is follow the same process pick another model another variant and try to run this particular thing that way you'll have you'll know whether you've understood the concept properly and um, you know are able to change things de- depending on the outcome that you want and obviously give it a shot like how gagan is showing here like the uh, test the outcome first right and and then work backwards to build all the apis needed to serve that particular outcome so yeah uh, thank you for watching this guys and uh, thank you gagan for doing this uh, on on such a short notice i personally have got my basic basics right of building an api with fast api and there's a very structured construct uh you know for anybody who's beginning off they can start off with this particular thing and then expand and add more layered complexities on it but i think so this is a good start point where a lot of use cases can easily be tackled with just this particular framework itself and so again thank you for doing this